upon the land or on the rolling sea. Come what may, from day to day, my heavenly Father watches over me. I trust in God, I know He cares for me, on mountain bleak, or on lake stormy sea. Father watches over me. He keeps the rose, the emblem of his care. He guides the eagle in the pathless air, and surely. Remembers me, my heavenly Father watches over me. I trust in God, I know He cares for me. On mountain bleak, on the stormy sea. Father, we thank you that we watch over the sparrows and we are of more value than the sparrows. The lilies of the field, they catch your attention. And we are of more value than the lily in the field. You are Heavenly Father. You watch over us mountain bleak on the stormy sea. Wherever circumstances or your providence in life may take us. High on the mountain, low in the valley, in the night, in the day, surrounded by friends or surrounded by foes, our Heavenly Father watches over us. And not a single air can fall to the ground without the knowledge of our Father. He is in control. He knows all things, knows all people, at all times. And he has all power to destroy whatever is contrary to his will. He can defend us. He can sustain us. He can lift us up. If we need to walk on the stormy sea, He can do it again. If He needs to lift up, Lord, lift us up in the mid air without even touching the ground and be lifted above all enemies and reptiles on the ground, He can do it. If He needs to move heaven and earth, trees, houses, people, Demons, if he needs to manifest his unchallenged authority over elements or men or demons, he can do it. And you are father. We are your children. You watch over us. Doesn't matter where we find ourselves. Underneath us are the everlasting arms. You have never failed. You will not fail. 
We pray that you will shine your light in our hearts to know that there is nothing in the deep, nothing on the earth, nothing in the sky to fear with you before us, behind us, above us, around us, there's nothing to fear. Therefore, Lord, we pray that you'll give us that undiluted faith that knows that our God is a powerful God and it will never change. So, Lord, we pray that you'll make us to have confidence, trust, and assurance in you that whatever betides, wherever we are, you are keeping watch over us. Help us to rest in your hand and in your bosom, knowing that there is no evil that has any poison or danger in it to destroy us. You are in control. Thank you, Lord, for your power and for your promises. In Jesus' name, I pray. We're considering the life of faith. Not just faith in isolation as a subject, but the life of faith. Not merely an expression, but a constant, persistent, continual attitude of life. A type of faith that affects our thoughts, our actions, our language. In this present age, we are living in an age that you can call the age of anxiety, the age of depression, the age of despair, because these three things, anxiety, Depression and despair are epidemic, rampant, very common in the age that we live. But there is a type of Bible heart faith that makes us victorious. A type of faith that makes the believer leave tomorrow's trouble for tomorrow's strength. He lives a day at a time. This is the faith that makes the believer to leave tomorrow's work for tomorrow's time. He doesn't try in his mind to do tomorrow's work in today's time. And he leaves tomorrow's trials to tomorrow's grace and tomorrow's God. There is no time or situation, or circumstance in which Christ cannot meet every need. Neither is there any problem too difficult for the Almighty to solve. However severe our problems might be, however great our hurts might appear to be, however dark the, the future may seem to be, God has a remedy for all our trials. We know not what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. And Christ is sufficient for every crisis. When the believer knows that, and he lives with that faith, then from day to day, he has victory, stability, confidence, fearlessness. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, 
not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. To live the life that is completely victorious will need the faith that Christ himself had. Look at every aspect and every section of the life of Jesus Christ. At conception, there was the possibility of Joseph rejecting the mother and the child until the angel stepped in and showed Joseph what had happened. At birth, there was the possibility of the young baby being killed because of the enmity, a terrible thing that Herod planned. But God was on the throne. He watched over his plan for his child, for his son. And in young adulthood, there was the possibility of forgetting this one that appeared in the temple at the age of 12. Now, the years have rolled by, and yet it appears that there is nothing forthcoming until he became 30 years of age. But at the appointed time, the Lord quickened, empowered, energized his only begotten son, and he appeared at Jordan River. Heavens opened, and a voice came from above, This is my beloved son. In his ministry, it appeared that all the forces of religion, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the Zealots, that they all gang together and crush him, destroy him. But he said, he that sent me is always with me. And I do those things that are pleasing in his sight. He lived the life he lived above every enemy, every difficulty by faith. Every area of his life was lived by faith. There was never a need, never a problem, never a crisis, never a circumstance that his faith did not see him through. And at last, in the climax of the events of his life, he went to the cross to finalize and fulfill the absolute will of God. And he is our example. And Paul the Apostle said that the life he now lived, he lived by the faith of the Son of God. And we too need that same faith of the Son of God. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by love. In First Peter, chapter 5, from verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, 
knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. In Zechariah chapter 2, verses 5 and 8. For I, says the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Here the Lord was given a promise not just to an individual but to a group of people. And he said, He, the Lord himself, will be a wall of fire round about and the glory in the midst and the church today living by the faith of the son of god should understand and must know that god himself had said he'll be a wall of fire around his people in verse 8 for thus says the lord of hosts after the glory as he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that touches you, touches the apple of his eye. If he made that promise to the people of the old covenant, he did it on the basis of love. But then we must begin to understand the benefits of the new covenant. He loved the Son, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, so very much. Very much. But then Jesus Christ, the Messiah, had caught the new covenant, established the new covenant, and thereby, through his sacrifice, the church has been born. Through his grace, through his perfect, absolute, acceptable offer unto the God of heaven, the church has been born. And he said, presenting the church to the Father, Behold, I and the children whom God has given me. And he said that the world may know that thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. If he loved Israel, there is much that he said, He that touched Israel touched the apple of his eye. It doesn't take a stretch of your imagination. It doesn't take you to have so great faith to believe that he must have loved his only begotten son more than he loved Israel. With everlasting love. And then if he has loved the church as he has loved Christ, this same promise must still apply to the church today. He that touches you touches the apple of his eye. Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Psalm 91, verse 4. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The believer who is fully conscious of divine power 
behind him. And of his own authority thereby can face the enemy without fear, without hesitation. The believer that meditates on these promises we have read and much more that we have not read from Zechariah, from the Psalms, from Luke, and from other portions of Scripture, will be able to face any enemy with any type of power without fear, without reservation, without hesitation. A man of faith, walking in faith, fighting the good fight of faith, warring in faith, realizes that there is a power infinitely greater than that which backs its enemies. In fact, when you really consider the power within you, the power behind you, the power supporting you, the power holding you, and you think about the powers of enemies against you, the powers of the enemies fade into insignificance because of the great power that supports and holds you. And when this is recognized by the believer, the enemies of the believers themselves will be forced and compelled to recognize that there is a hidden power infinitely greater than whatever you can do against the true believer. Faith gives no place to fear. And this is the faith we need to carry us onward in the battles of life. You should understand that to overcome just like Jesus overcame, we need nothing less than the faith that made him to overcome. In Numbers chapter 13, Numbers chapter 13, here we see examples as far back as the time of the wilderness experience of the children of Israel. On the one side, we have the example of faith, unadulterated, unmixed, solid, strong faith. But on the other hand, we see unbelief, shameful unbelief. Shameful in the sense that their hearts had been hardened in unbelief despite the many signs and wonders they had seen God manifesting on their behalf. One, before Moses was ever born, Israel must have understood that Egypt did not want that nation to remain as a nation. The plan of the enemy had been on for a very long time to sink every baby, boy that was born in River Nile, and to keep only the baby girls alive. But it didn't work. They should have known that there was a God in heaven watching over the interests of the people, even before their deliverer came. And then, they subjected them to serious labor of slavery. And yet, the more they punished them, and the more they made them to go through the rigor and terrible labor, the more they were strengthened. And yet, Israel at this time had not understood. Moses came to the land eventually, and there were ten different plagues 
that God brought upon Egypt so that Pharaoh will change his mind, change his utterance, because he had said, I know not that God, therefore I will not let Israel go. And God manifested ten definite miraculous events, the ten plagues of Egypt by his mighty power. Israel should have understood how great their God was. They had come through into the wilderness. The Red Sea had been parted. They had gone over. That was only half the story. The rest of the story is that Egypt had entered in and a miracle had been performed to make the waters come back and to swallow up the children of Egypt. They should have understood that God was a great God and that his power will never change. He had given water out of the rock. He had also given them manna out of heaven every day. But now they sp sent spies to the land of Canaan to go and see what the land looks like. And they came back, ten, with unbelief, two, with faith. From Numbers, 20, Numbers 13, 27, And he told him, and said, We came unto the land, whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled or silenced the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. They brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to such age is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there, we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. They manifested unbelief because they did not fully and truly consider all that they had experienced before. Today, we have seen the miracle hand of God in our lives. And we ought to consider all that he has taken us through already. By faith, we have been saved. By faith, a few of us have been sanctified. By faith, a few have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. By faith, a few of us have seen the real power of God manifested. By faith, quite a number of people have been healed and provided for. And when we meditate on all these things that we have seen done by God, we understand then there is no reason to look at the negatives, but only to look at God's word 
and Christ's example. Of course, faith is not unaware of persecutions. Christ wasn't aware of, wasn't unaware of persecutions. He knew there were persecutions, but he had faith. Faith is not unaware of accusations, of troubled seas, of the possibility of a treacherous person coming to betray. Neither would we be unaware of the possibility of religious hatred just because we have faith, but like Christ, living by the faith of the Son of God, we see all that and yet we see like Christ and we speak like Christ. Because of faith, we do not exaggerate our problems in an attempt to receive sympathy from people. That will be a mark of unbelief. That will be evil. What those ten spies were guilty of is that they exaggerated their problems. They exaggerated the size of the sons of Anak. They exaggerated the smallness of their strength and said that they were like grasshoppers. They became guilty of speaking evil. It was unbelief in their heart that led them to exaggeration. And it is unbelief in their heart today that will make a man or a woman to exaggerate his problem to secure sympathy. Talk about his family problem in an exaggerated manner. Talk about his difficulty at the place of work in an exaggerated manner. Talk about the difficulties he's facing in the work of the Lord. The dangers he has met already on the field in an exaggerated manner to secure, to receive sympathy from people. It's a mark of unbelief. Jesus never did that. His eyes were focused on God the Father. And the Bible tells us that having been surrounded with all these clouds of witnesses, let's lay aside every weight and every sin that does so easily be said, to run the race that is set before us, and then looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Looking at his example. Looking at his reactions against problems. Never blowing up, expanding, or inflating the problems and the persecutions so that people will say, Aren't you going through so much? Isn't this will of God costing you so much? How weak do you feel now? Never. And it's the same attitude of faith we ought to have. And that attitude of faith, one, will make us to reign in righteousness. Two, it will make us to be faithful in faith. And three, it will make us to be courageous and consecrated. Let's see how we reign in life through the faith. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one much more, they that they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. In first John chapter five verse four For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is a victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. But 
we had the sentence of death in ourselves. That we should not trust in ourselves, but trust in God, which raised the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, and in whom we trust that he will yet deliver. In faith and by faith, Paul the Apostle looked back. He gave a testimony. He delivered us in the past. Looking at his present circumstances, he said, right in the present moment, we believe and trust he is delivering us. He does deliver. Then he looks into the future. As if to say, I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that what I've committed into his hand is able to keep until that day. And looking into that future and not seeing any danger there'll be, that there will be no strength to pass through between now and the time Jesus comes or calls. He said, and we trust they will yet deliver us. A person of faith, a man or woman of faith, will know that God is sufficient and His grace is abundant and adequate. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me? In Romans chapter 4. From verse 19 to verse 20. And be not weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred years old, yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Whatever circumstance in the family, a man or a woman of faith, will not stagger at the promise of God, will not be weighed down by the condition or the situation in the family. May be a case of family members being sick. May be a case of some oppression, physical or spiritual. May be a case of some problems that appears they spent all they have and yet, there is no way out of the wood. Yet, because of the promises, this man, this woman, will not give up his Christian experience. He will not give up his Christian commitment. Neither will he give up his Christian persuasion. He will continue serving God, giving glory to God, living to the glory of God, because he'll be fully persuaded that no long in fulfillment, what God has promised is able also to perform. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the furry darts of the wicked, the darts, the arrows of the enemy that come in a thought life, arrows that come from foes, from persecutors, from strategic planning of the devil to destroy that believer's Christian experience or to make the person totally turn back 
this person that is living by the faith of the Son of God is able to apply the shield of faith to quench all those fiery darts. We are here to live, to live a life glorifying to God. The faith life reigns over sin, over temptation, over circumstances, over situations, over frustrations and annoyances caused by faith we daily appropriate the power that keeps us from being weak on the day of battle. The power that keeps us from being weary while running the race. And the power that keeps us from being exhausted while we're working for the Lord. True faith overcomes the world, the lust, the pride, the things of the world. Thereby, we constantly resist the advances, the advice, the enticements, the suggestions of the God of this world. In all circumstances, faith keeps us in positive attitude, praising the Lord. When a man has faith, real faith, true faith, New Testament faith, he does not make a God of any man. He does not exalt any man of wealth, any man of ability, to the place where he has absolute trust in that man and he forsakes God. He doesn't depend upon man and make man a substitute for God. Faith relates to God directly and to his word. And it is faith that lifts up the man that is manifesting that faith above the realm of man's ability or even his own ability. And he makes God's possibilities available unto him. In Psalm 1, 1, 8. Verses 8 and 9. Psalm 1, 1, 8. Verses 8 and 9. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And so, a man that is manifesting faith, real faith, will trust God for everything, every time. For everything, money, man of faith doesn't become a beggar. For provisions of life, a man of faith doesn't feel that God has abdicated his responsibility watching over the children of God and therefore begin to accuse God of neglect and so try to depend upon man or depend upon princes. In all circumstances in life, a man of faith is not only manifesting faith when he wants to get healed, he manifests faith in all areas of his life, putting his confidence and his trust in God. In persecution, he doesn't run. God is with him. In problems, he doesn't forsake the people of God, where the problem might be, because he has faith in God. Neither does he go back to his relatives in the time of need, putting his confidence in an uncle, a cousin, because now it appears 
that the church is failing. In fact, a man of faith, a woman of faith, doesn't he put his confidence on the people in the church. It isn't the people in the church that will provide the manna out of heaven. It's God himself. It's not the people that will provide the need of the individual. It's God himself. And a man of faith, a woman of faith, has his faith centered on the God of heaven. He is the one watching over the true believer and the real believer. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, thus says the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. And haven't we made man our confidence? Haven't we trusted man to the point that we feel that we don't need to talk to the, our God in our house? We will not pray. We don't even need to talk to that God when we come to the church. We feel that there is somebody that will give us all that we need. But the Bible makes it very clear. We come under a curse. When we put our trust, our confidence in man, and haven't we who are pastors or preachers come under a fiery curse? As we are trying to build a new church, we sit down Saturday night in our mind with imagination, we picture people in the church. And in our mind, we put it down so we will not forget that that man in the church, he has a factory. If he can contribute 10,000 naira, that other person he has is working with the airways and has his own airline. If he can contribute just 25,000 naira, that other fellow that runs a boss business, and has a fleet of buses going on interstate traffic, transportation. If he can just give 5,000 naira, and then all those other people that we have that are rich in the church, if I can get them to make a pledge of just 1,000 naira each, and all the people that are working, among all these people that are working, we should have about at least um, 50 in this bracket of salary, at least I know so and so, he wouldn't be riding a Peugeot vehicle if he didn't have that scale. Then you put all that down and without prayer. As to God, the source of all our supply, even for church work, we come to the church and we make announcements. And then we say, I know there are people there, those are people you have been thinking about. That if you will just do what God is telling you now, God is not telling them anything. You have not taught them to hear from God. You have not taught them to know the will of God. They are not spiritual enough to hear God. If they can't hear God to take care of their wives, they can't hear God giving money in the church. If they cannot hear God, to make restitution of the money they have stolen in the places of work. They cannot hear God contributing money in the church. But you have made them your God, your source of supply. You are under a curse. Cursed be the man, the pastor, that trusteth in men and maketh those men the arm of flesh, his support, his supply. His heart has departed from the Lord. When it happens like that, you are forsaking God. You are not trusting in God. You are trusting in the people. You will not want to offend the people because now they are your God. You can offend the God of heaven because he is now occupying the second place. That's why God became so serious about it and he put such people under a curse. For ye shall be 
like the heath in the desert, and shall, shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. You'll be lonely, like you live in isolation. The angels around you, God will give them a command, come back home. He doesn't need the guardian angels. He has his people that he depends upon. And those of you depend upon people outside. Some people have traveled out of your location to Britain or to America or they have gone to Japan or they are in Tokyo. And over there, they are the god of technology. And they have electronic organ, they have computer, they have a lot of things. And over here, our God in Nigeria is not able to meet the need of the church. And you're always writing to that man overseas. Deeper life man, that's all right. He's a man also. Because said, you see, that depends on that deeper life man for his supply. And maketh that deeper life man a source of supply. And you replace God by that poor miserable man overseas. We're forsaking God. We are not living the life of faith. The provision of the church is no more coming from the head of the church. God is no more caring for his own church and providing for the need of the church. We now need the car owners to rely upon. We need those who have traveled out to rely upon. We need to know the members and we need to make some investigation of members in our churches who have foreign exchange. And instead of finding out their spiritual lives, we're finding out how is your business? How do you transfer money? Where do you have branches of your corporation or company? How do you get money over there? How do you get all this? Oh, well, he says, I have some exchange. And you remember the church, you didn't tell us all this. And we've been praying, 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 praying. And our knees are almost as hardened as a monkey's knee. And you are there to supply it. And we have been praying. <laughs> Thank God I discovered you today. No more prayer. God, I won't trouble you again. I found my God here. And we have to be going to his house now, visiting his house, looking for him, so that we can have money. You become a slave. And when you are falling, from the throne where God put you, seated in heavenly places, and you have become a beggar and a slave to a rich man. Already you are under a curse. You who are planning marriages, plan your marriage on God alone. There's no money, look up to God. But having to go and surrender yourself, the dignity of the believer that God himself has redeemed to a car owner. And you are looking for a car that you will use on the day of the wedding. Is it compulsory to use a car on the day of the wedding? You have to be begging and begging and begging. When did Christians become beggars? Let me tell you this. Without anybody misunderstanding. When I was young, much younger than this. And I came to major cities. Doesn't matter which major city. All the people that we saw begging on the street, on the road, under the bridges, they were people that were either of the other religion or they are totally pagans. The church goers will not come to the street to beg, even when they are not born again. It's only of the other religion and the pagans. The pagans that have twin babies and their idols, their witch doctors told them that they should carry those babies on. It was as part of their religion, begging for the money. Or one of the babies died and they replaced that dead baby with wood and carried that at the back. 
they were the people I saw when I was young going about begging. And every time, whenever I saw somebody begging, I knew that that one is not a Christian. I don't mean being born again, but ordinary, church-going, religious, nominal Christian. How is it then? That those who are born again are now the competent, trained beggars in our churches, in our choir, among our ushers, among our zonal leaders. They cannot marry except they go and beg to have a vehicle. They cannot marry except that the house fellowship and the zone will contribute money. And they're looking up to them. They won't pray. What is the zone going to do for me? What is the zone going to do for you? What has God done for you to start with? Tell us if what God has done for you is not sufficient and you need us to help God, come and tell us. Go to God first. When he has failed, when he is not sufficient, when he cannot make enough provision, when the man has dried up from heaven, when there is no more rock that can bring out water, when there is no supernatural anymore that can bring money out of the fish, when the Almighty has reduced the almightiness, when the promises have become shaking, and when God is no more God, come back to us and say, God has failed, now you help me to replace God. We'll see what to do. But it brings you under a curse. The life we live that shows that we are believers, we depend upon God, that we will say, I've given my life to God, and he watches over the sparrows, and he'll take care of me. And he will. And Jesus said, fear not man, that can kill the body, and after that he has nothing to do, but fear him, who can kill the body, and then draw the soul into hell. And then he said, but don't you worry about anything like that. All the heirs of your head are numbered, and none will fall to the ground without his notice and knowledge. If it is so, why do we have to be cringing and fearing and begging and crawling before men? Can depend upon God. We have some men now that will be stationed somewhere, and people will be going to them. I need work. Okay, stay there. Another person comes, I need work. Who is your husband? Go and call your husband. He's not pastor. He just have block-making factory by the side of the road, and he's their God. And we have to line up before him. We are forsaking our God. We cannot pray in our closet. We cannot pray in our chamber and say, God of heaven, I'm your child. Here am I, provide for me. And my God shall supply all your needs, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We don't need that block-making factory man. Let him continue his work. God bless him if he's a Christian. But do we need his money? Do we need his employment? Do we need for him to make the members of the church captives? And we're sending the church to that place, sending the church to another place. And they feel important. I would pity them. It's we that made them feel important. Many of them are not sound in Christian faith. But because we have made them God, shouldn't they feel important? But if we're going to live the life of faith, and everybody around will know that pastor depends on God for every amount of money that comes into the church, that pastor depends upon God for everything that is done in that local church, then they respect you that you are a pastor preaching faith, living by faith, standing by faith. It says in verse 7, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted in the waters, by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but a leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Faith enables us 
to endure and overcome the tests and the hardships that confront us in our daily life. Number two, faithfulness in faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, Verse 1, verse 6, and verse 7. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, verse 2, the elders obtained a good report. Verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his soul, of his house, by which he obtained, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. A man of faith cannot be unfaithful to God. It's a contradiction to say that he is a man of faith and yet he is unfaithful to God. Faith makes the true believer live and act as he ought. Noah believed in God against the world. The world didn't believe in what he believed in. But that's the meaning of faith. Faith makes you to be different from the world. He was willing to suffer in God's will rather than prosper in the world's views. He believed in the spirit, but the other people believed in the senses. He knew there was something far beyond what he saw, what he heard, what he tasted, what he touched, what he felt. When God announced to him that the flood will be coming, he didn't see it, but he believed. He didn't hear it from the news around, but he believed from God. Neither could he taste or touch, neither did he feel. He took God at his word. He reverenced God. He obeyed God. Though God's message might have looked foolish at that moment, he laid aside all the other things to concentrate on doing what God's message commanded. It was foolish to start building a great boat at that time. And yet, you can see that he concentrated on doing what God's will and message commanded. Building the ark, building the boat, and laid every other thing aside. That's faith. Noah's life was one of continued and concentrated preparation for what God had said will come. That's faith. When you are continually preparing because of what God had said, that means you believed the word of the Lord. He lived as if the message was the most important thing in the whole world. Noah's life of faith must have looked foolish to the men of unbelief around him. It is one of the hardest challenges of the lifestyle of faith that we have to be prepared to sometimes be a fool for Jesus' sake and for his glory. Then in Hebrews chapter 11, from verse 8, consecration and courage through faith. From verse 8, by faith, Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and went out not knowing whither he went. That's the faith. How many people today want to know the end from the beginning? And they're going around they say that the Lord is calling them to full-time service. So they go around to all our full-time workers 
And uh, they say, brother, uh, I just want to talk with you. If you can tell me, well, this might be personal to you, but uh, as a full-time worker, what are you receiving? And that one will say, well, this is what I'm receiving. Thank you. We'll go to another worker and say, uh, bro, because uh, you never can tell when uh, some of us will join you people and give all our life to the Lord. But by the way, uh, how much are they paying you? And then that man might say, well, this is all I'm receiving. How do you manage then? Well, uh, this happens, this happens. Is that so? Then go to another person. They want to know where they are going before they take a step. If you enter into full-time work like that, you enter in unbelief. You enter with a curse. You're not going to do that work. You'll come out of it eventually. You don't have a call. When God called Abraham, he did not know where he was going, but he was sure of the call. If you are sure of the call, you don't need assurance about any other thing. The Lord will take care of the rest. But the present state of unbelief, of anxiety, of despair, and the present state of worry that makes people to want to know everything in the future. In our marriages, I know we teach our people to pray, but it's going to take a lot of discipline. I don't mean discipline to stop somebody from work. A lot of control for even the pastors to allow the people to live by faith. If you don't know what pastors could do, if they are unbelieving, a woman comes and said, Sir, a brother spoke to me concerning marriage. And this pastor happens to know that this woman is um, a person that has a delicate type of life. Feeding, dressing, the taste looks a little bit elegant. And then the other fellow that has gone to speak to this woman happens to be, in a natural sense, a normal, ordinary person. In the normal, in the natural sense, not having too much money. But the lady will not know, generally, except those ladies who have been looking and not praying. So, after the man has spoken to the woman, because of what we teach, that we want to know what is happening about your marriage, come to the pastor. And the pastor in the local government area or state capital say, what story do you have? Well, brother, so-and-so came to talk with me on marriage. Have you prayed? Well, even before he came, the Lord had been laying him on my heart, but I'm still going to pray to have a confirmation. <laughs> you have to, all these things you say, Lord, Lord, you have to be very careful and uh, pray very well. But I need to help you as a pastor. That's what they say. They need to help them as a pastor. They can't pray. God won't help them. The Spirit of God can't help those women. The pastor has to help them. This man that has spoken to you, well, I'm not saying you should not pray. I'm only telling you that he doesn't have a vehicle. He's living in just a room. I'm not saying you shouldn't pray, but I pray you should be intelligent. And uh, we're still, in fact, I need to tell you this, that the church has been giving him money on charity to even feed him. But marriage is your business. Go and pray. And whatever the Lord says, come back to tell me. You are his God. You've told him already, he can't, she can't marry that man. The man doesn't have money. And if they ever get married... God cannot, uh, in the olden days, God used to give manna, not today. That's what you are telling that lady. In the olden days, God used to give them water out of the rock. But if you depend on the Bible, and you read Bible, and you see all those miracles, water coming out of the rock, and you believe it, and you stand on it, you will suffer. That's what you are telling that woman. 
you teach them unbelief. You take them away from the past of the total, absolute will of God. Because you say, you know them. They have been seeking counseling. Because after your marriage, if I didn't counsel you well and you suffer, I'll be feeling guilty. That's not counseling. That's walking by sight. How do you know that that man today that doesn't appear to have anything, how do you know? Have you, have you lost hope on him that God can never prosper him? Are you saying that that man that is poor today, so you have sized him up that he'll be poor forever till he die? You are not a good pastor. But to allow people to understand that when they say the Lord is leading, we don't use this type of cunning, clever, serpent wisdom to dissuade people and to turn them off from the absolute will of God that even though they don't know where they are going, that we tell them, we're teaching you faith. And if that is the will of God, if there is anything that is even uh, not uh, very good, if it is the will of God, God will move heaven and earth and hell if necessary to make sure that that thing will work out. But if we don't understand that that is faith, all the faith we are talking about is when I come on Thursday or Friday for Miracle Revival, our headache goes. That may not be faith after all. But the faith to live by. That every area of your life is affected by the faith of the Son of God. And everything that you do in the church is also affected by the faith of the Son of God. Abraham obeyed. He went out, not knowing whither he went. In verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They were persuaded of them, and they embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. One of the writers of the early centuries of the Christian faith, that is the first two centuries. One of those writers put this down and said on this verse that were strangers and pilgrims. He said, the man of faith looks at the world as a bridge. The wise man, the man of faith, will pass over it as a bridge. He will not build his house upon the bridge. He will not settle permanently upon the bridge. This world is a bridge. We will soon cross over to where we are really going. We are on a journey. Don't build your house on the bridge. In the world, don't put all your heart, all your affection, everything you have. Let your heart be in heaven. Let your treasure be in heaven. And by faith, you see afar off. And you know where you are going. And you say, no matter what I'm going through now, I know that when I get to the place I'm going, everything will be different. By faith, in verse 9, he sojourned in the land of promise. As in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, with the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. In um, aeronautics, of those who fly, the pilot has a point of no return. That is, he would have taken fuel where he was taken up at the point of departure. Then, at the beginning of the journey, when there is still enough fuel, if something happened and he wanted to come back, he could still come back and say, I'm sorry, I cannot make the journey. But he travels on. Let's say the journey will take six hours in the air. And the fuel will take just about six and a half hours. And he's going and going and going. And he has traveled four hours. 
remaining two hours to get to where he is going. If something happens at that point to the aircraft, if he tries to come back, he'll have to come back four hours, and the fuel will not take four hours and four hours, making eight hours. Now, the people that study aeronautics will say that at that point, four hours, when he cannot make another journey back four hours, he had reached a point of no return. Whatever is happening, he has to have confidence and trust and faith and say, there's no point going back. I have to continue. That's what happened to Abraham. God called him. He set out in faith. He led his country, led his people. Then God said, drive away Hagar. And uh, to do that, and Ishmael. And after they were driven away, the Isaac that remained, God said, Abraham said, here am I. Bring that Isaac, burn him up for me. Can't go back. His faith had reached the point of no return. Because he couldn't go back, what then did he believe? He believed that he will have to raise him up. When you reach a point of no return, your faith comes to a higher level. But when you still have a point where you say, well, if it's not convenient, I'll go back, you'll never have faith. This afternoon, where do you stand? Do you have faith in God? If it happens that you are the only Christian in the whole of Nigeria, can you trust God? If heaven, earth, if it were possible for all of them to forsake you, for you to stand alone, can you still stand for God? Do you have the faith that overcomes? In this world, on the stormy sea, in the valley, among enemies and persecutors, whatever comes, whatever betides, have you reached the point of no return? And you have said, Lord, there's no other way. The only thing for me is to have a higher kind of faith, and I will live this life, because there is no going back. Rise up and let us pray. O oh God, our rock, we want to say we are sorry for the insults we have put upon you because of our misconduct, misbehavior. Forgive us in Jesus' name. You are plenteous in mercy. Your mercy is also everlasting. Have mercy upon us, Lord, in Jesus' name. But we are saying today, you will be our rock forever. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. We are saying, from now, you are going to be our shepherd. You will make us, you will lead us, all that we are, all that we'll do, it will be because of you. No man to fear, no storm that will come our way. We will prefer to suffer in your will than to get out of your will for any pleasure. Father, our feet, let them remain unmovable upon you. We are going to stand. We are going to move. We are going to, oh Lord, do all we'll do. And you are going to supply all our needs. According to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We depend upon you. We will, not, we are, we will never suffer anything. Because you are a good God. What is good will be ours. Oh Lord, we shall serve you. All our life. All our days. Thank you for answered our prayers. Thank you for such a message like this. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the vessel you have used. I am asking, Lord, the infilling of the Holy Spirit.
let it be abundant upon him in Jesus' name. Overflowing of the Holy Spirit, that as a, we hear more, we will, be, we will be not only shaping, we will be brightening for the future. Oh Lord, that our life, it will be a challenge, not only our, our brethren in the cities, in the towns and the villages, but to all Christians all over the world in Jesus' name. Thank you for answering our prayers. In Jesus